Good evening, everybody. May I grab everybody's attention? Um, thank you all so much for coming out um, and being here on this really, I would say, I'm going to go as far as saying historic evening to be with Sarah Z tonight. We are really fortunate. Um, on behalf of my colleagues at the museum and the board of trustees, and I'm going to say the Friends of Congress Square, the City of Portland, the Public Art Committee, welcome. We are so pleased to have you here with us tonight. As my notes say here, and many of you heard, uh, this project has been about a decade in the making. That's about a decade in the making. As I said, I also want to recognize the Public Art Committee, as well as the Friends of Congress Square, and also um, a close friend, board member, and real advocate, Brie LaCase. Brie, are you here? Just a big shout out to Brie. <laughs> In 2012, the Portland Public Art Committee made the decision to commit funding for the commission of a signature public artwork for Congress Square. A 10-member artist selection committee comprised of leaders in Portland's arts community worked for over a year to identify four artist finalists. Over 100 local residents participated in a public interview of the finalists. Ultimately, Sarah was selected to design fabricate and install a site-specific sculpture in Congress Square. And we are so glad that she was selected. The sculpture will be installed as part of the Congress Square redesign, a project that will transform a car-dominated and inaccessible area and dangerous into a world-class urban space. With the redesign, the updated traffic flow and crosswalk width and placement will ease congestion and significantly improve safety for all modes of transportation particularly walkers. The improved performance area will facilitate educational, cultural, and community programming, inviting pathways, seat walls, shade trees, plantings, lighting, a natural playscape, and a splash pad will provide a welcome year-round urban respite. We at the museum are particularly excited about the significant extension of the PMA Plaza on our side as well. If you didn't get a chance to look over the renderings of the redesign on your way in, I encourage you to do so after the lecture. They're just outside of the auditorium. The museum is such a proud partner to be part of this transformational project. Now, it is my immense pleasure to introduce Sarah Z. Z's immersive works challenge the static nature of art. Her work questions the value society places on images and objects, and how they both ascribe meaning to the places and the times we inhabit. Widely recognized for expanding the boundaries between painting, sculpture, video, and installation, Caesar's work ranges from intimate paintings that collapse time and space to expansive installations that create complex constellations of materials and public works that scale walls and colonize architecture, architectures. C was awarded a MacArthur Fellowship in 2003 and a Radcliffe Fellowship in 2005. In 2013, she represented the United States at the Venice Biennale. Her work is exhibited in museums worldwide and held in the permanent collections of prominent institutions such as MoMA in New York, SF MoMA, the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum, and Tate Modern. Z has created many public works, including pieces for the Seattle Opera House, the MTA Authority, the MTA in New York and LaGuardia Airport in New York, and in 2021, C unveiled a new permanent commission for the Storm King Art Center in New York. The ability to have Sarah Z, a Sarah Z piece, and Sarah Z, she is one of the most important artists of our time, and you are in a real treat tonight as she walks us through her work and the meaning of her work and how important it is for us to have one here in Portland, Maine. Now, without any further ado, I would like to welcome Sarah Z. Thank you so much. Such a nice introduction. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here, and uh, I think this is a really special project. Um, I talked about it a little bit this morning, but um, I think it's rare to have such a community-driven project in a place that uh, both can benefit from it, and there's a real sort of potential and love of that location, this intersection between the art school, the museum, and um, so many entries to this point. So it's a, real, it's a real honor to be able to propose this piece to Portland. Um, and I'm going to start 
Oops. I think I did. I'm going to start by giving you a little uh, an image first. Do you, do you mind? Can I turn? Can you turn the lights down on me so I can see the audience? That light? Anyone? Maybe. Thank you so much. So um, I'm going to just start by showing you an image of the work um, that we are fabricating, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit about. Um, actually, the most most of the work is from the last couple of years, um, from right before the pandemic to now, and give you a sense of sort of where this comes from, where it grew out of. Um, the last time I was on the stage was 2016 um, with, in, in the competition uh, lectures for um, the piece with, with the other artists. Um, so uh, I, it's good to be back four years later. So this is the work that we're, we're making. And it's a, it's a kind of idea that you harness the sky and bring it down to the earth. Um, and you have two sides to the work. You have the sky in, in this shattered sphere that you kind of bring together as a viewer with your eye. You make the sphere because it's sort of in a process of being put together or falling apart, which is an idea that I've been thinking about in sculpture, to make sculptures feel live because they're sort of in this in-between state of becoming. Um, and it has this sphere that reflects the sky, but on the back it reflects what's around it in a dynamic way. And I'm going to talk about it at the end of the lecture. I'm going to come back to it. But I wanted to give it you this image to think about um, in relation to uh, the other works I'm going to show you. And one of the things that I've been really thinking about is how we are inundated by images, and that images and objects have been confused in many ways, and that we use, I'm really thinking about how we, how we use images to trace time. Um, so this is a work that I did um, since the proposal for, uh, for Portland. And it's related. Um, it's the same, similar idea of a sphere, actually, that is, that is a void. So the sculpture itself is really only uh, a structure that is kind of heart, is nesting a void. So there's nothing round in this piece. It's actually um, the images are held up um, to create the sphere, um, uh, but, but that your eye really makes the round sphere. It puts together the images. And there's this hole sort of in the center you'll see where you look into it and you see the images. But from the back, you only see these white, sort of the white um, uh, of the back. And, and see as you come around, you have this kind of dynamic entry into seeing the entire space. And the images in this work are from, from dusk to dawn. So you see at the edges, um, you see where there's sunset and there's sundown. And the hole is actually where night would be when you look back into the piece. Um, so this is looking up into the piece. And you know, in many ways, this, is, this, these were, this was conceived um, alongside con the Congress Square piece and has a lot of similarities, which I'll talk about later when I talk about Congress Square. This is where you see it from below. So this kind of idea that sculpture is different and dynamic from different directions. This is a piece that I did um, before uh, that work. And so you can see sort of already, this is one of the first pieces where it was kind of a, an idea that it was a, um, a, this kind of nesting of space, right? Again, this idea that you're, you're looking at a structure that's really holding a neg negative space. One of the things I'm interested in is what you can do in a museum, what you can do in a public space, what you can do with painting, what you can do with video, and how those things are different. Um, and so that was obviously a sculpture with video in it that we can only do in a museum. Um, but I wanted to see how you can do something then and make it into a painting. So that's a painting that obviously sort of came out of the sculpture. So I wanted to use this, this slideshow to sort of show you how the work generates from one medium to the next. So this is a painting um, that you go into, and you see this, again, this idea of parts that become a whole, which is also in the Congress Square piece, that you are sort of putting together, collaging together these pieces to make the whole itself. I think and this is a video just to show you the evolution of these paintings that happen one into the next. And I'm interested in this idea of how an image imprints in your memory. When we have so many images coming into our head, which ones do we save? Which ones do we lose? How do we edit those out? What do we remember? What really sticks with us? You know, one of the most important things to me about an artwork is when you remember it three years later. You know, so sometimes you, you don't even understand how much an artwork means to you until you see it over time. And art historically, and I think that's the case too, certain art it becomes more important over time because 
other artists start to work in that way and they're revived historically, right? So this idea of what we kind of retrieve and what we remember and what's, what, what, what remains um, is an important idea to me. So also this idea of a kind of portal or an entryway. Again, in the Portland piece too, there's this idea that you kind of enter the piece once you're up close to it and it surrounds you. So even with an image like a painting to when I hang it, I think about it becoming a portal or an entry. Um, and when you get up close, you have a different experience and then you have portals into the painting itself um, and they continue to portal and portal um, as you get closer to them. So these paintings were actually all done during the pandemic um, and they also have this kind of idea of a kind of cent centrifugal energy that also Portland has. Uh, how do you, you know, create dynamism? How do you create movement? Um, how do you make it, again, something feel alive, like it's in a process um, of becoming or degrading? Um, and again, to, to mix the digital and the material, and the two-dimensional and the three-dimensional, to confuse them, to make us think about how that's being confused in contemporary life in a way I think that um, I'm not sure that people have ever experienced before, and how we're navigating that. Um, and, Back to the oldest tool, drawing. Um, so this is a drawing for a piece I did uh, during the pandemic in Paris, um, which unfortunately was closed for much of the show. But it starts with this idea of, you know, I wanted to show this because I think also this idea of how do we imagine things before they become. So this is the piece after it, after it was done. Um, it's, uh, again, you see the relationship to the, to the Congress Square piece but it has the potential to do much more ephemeral things, to do video because it's, because it's an indoor piece. Um, this piece is in a building by Jean Nouvel, which is completely glass, so it also had the potential to do the outside of the building, you'll see, and the inside, um, uh, and to play with this idea of what a moving image is and what a still image is. I think we are receiving so many images now that it's almost, we never see images still, right? We're always flipping through them. When we take a picture, we're often taking 12, right? And so this questioning of what, you know, what is a still an image? What is, a, what is a, um, you know, what is a moving image and how they've merged? So many of these images are actually stills from videos that then are projected back onto um, the video itself. Um, but this was a, a, obviously an opportunity to make an entirely immersive um, space. But similar to, again, Portland, um, the work, I think when you come close to it, you have this real sense of this real play of scale shifts that the, the, the world of the piece suddenly engulfs you and your shift, there's a shift in scale as you move into the work. And on the other side of, of the same building, uh, I did a piece that was on the floor and it had a pendulum in it. Um, I'll see the video. Um, and it relates to another work that I think relates to Portland in, in this mirror polish. So you can see this, um, let's see, I can use this. This is actually, a, was a model for a piece I did for Storm King that then became part of the work, this stainless steel in the work. Let's see it. Pointer. Uh, and the images on the floor, the video actually changes again. It's like a timekeeper. It changes from day to night, so it's like a clock. Um, so it traced the sky as it um, as it went um, through the the um, the evening into the day and caught just those little. You realize how quickly that flash of color happens between dusk and dawn. Um, and this is an image just to show you. So this is the piece that, um, this was actually a model for a work that I'll show you more of, um, that I did at Storm King in upstate New York. Um, and it shows you actually how I made the model. And it's interesting to think about, I think, you know, what is analog and what is digital and how things are, are made. So this is really handmade. But in order to make it on the scale, I needed to 
We had it photographed, you know, and it's, it's called, you photograph it and you make it into a digital model, and then it comes back out of the digital into the physical again in Made in Steel. So, but it really wanted it to start with this idea of a material in a state of degradation or in a state of becoming, so that it had a kind of time, how sculpture can kind of signal a time that can be glacial, that can be speeding, but that there's a dynamism about an object that can actually imitate time. So this is in my studio. You can see that it was a one-to-one -one scale, and part of it was actually just letting the material dry and crack um, and then respond to it. So it was really, a, a, really working with the, the kind of um, the way a material behaves. And I think a lot of my work is actually about landscape, but it's less about Im the imitation of landscape and more about the behavior of landscape. So to thinking about things like entropy, thinking about things like growth, death, something that's in a process of, of, of becoming or transition. How do you breathe life into inanimate materials is basic question that artists have asked for centuries. So this is actually a rendering um, of the work, and we didn't know if it would work, that it would really, uh, this idea that it would bring, sort of the, the reflect the sky. Um, and so this was actually a um, sample, that the first sample we made, and I wanted to, I wanted to have like, I was talking about this speed, I wanted the speed on the surface to be very fast and to be reflecting of the, the immediacy of time, but the sides to be almost kind of a glacial time and have that edge be very sharp. And so the first piece was kind of exciting because we realized, we put it in the grass and we realized, oh, it is going to reflect the sky. So this was actually to give you a sense of you know, how these pieces are made. So this is, these are the pilings that were down. This is how this piece is actually fitted into the ground. And again, that's the rendering and that's the real piece. So it was this kind of really exciting moment to see that it actually worked. And with both these pieces that this was also done during the pandemic, LaGuardia and Storm King, and with Congress Square, they're actually proposals for a kind of fabrication that has never been done before. So when we went to fabricators for both those pieces and we said, we want to put enamel images onto, um, onto these, these, you know, Small, small pieces of metal and hang them in a spherical form, for example, with LaGuardia. The, every fabricator was sort of like, well, we've never done this, but we're, we're willing to try. Um, and so we luckily work with really interesting fabricators, who are the ones who want to try things that have never been done. With this piece to create that edge between um, a stainless steel edge, to have it be that sharp to a rough edge, it's a very hard thing to do. Um, and we were really lucky to work with some very inventive fabricators to do it um, and uh, to be able to create it. So that opened, I think, a couple months ago um, up in Storm King. But it's an important part, uh, and I'll talk about it again at the end, um, of the Portland piece, because the back of the Portland piece, if you remember, uh, um, it, it's actually, it is mirrored stainless steel, and it has this idea that it will reflect these, the, these plantings that are going to happen. So it'll be orange in the fall, it'll be you know, white in, around snow in a similar way. I wanted, that's why I wanted to show you so many images of this, of how it's radically different um, it, it, in the different seasons and times, um, and it reflects the weather itself. Um, and indoors at Storm King, they have a room there. I wanted to do something indoors where it was almost like creating a, a landscape that was in a pavilion, or like this kind of idea of how do you bring the landscape into the space. So I did this long, scaled to the actual architecture of the building. Um, it's a painting, but then it comes down onto the floor, and this idea of almost kind of blowing out the side of the building and, and, and bringing a landscape into the space um, was the idea for this work. And to have these two things juxtaposed that were really different, like what can you do indoors? And this is, it just closed today. So um, this is a temporary piece, so you can do really temporary ephemeral things that you can't do outside. But for me, they have a similar, they have this similar DNA, this idea of, you know, seeing something come to life, seeing something that will change over time. Um, seeing uh, this kind of idea of trying to understand how landscape is constantly evolving. Um, and you can see in the video that there are videos reprojected into the space um, itself. There's painting, it's this kind of merging of moving images, flat images, collage, um, all at once. 
Um, there, there's videos of the way light moves naturally in the space, and then it's reprojected into the space. So when you're there, you can't really you can't decide what's actually the real light coming through the window and the time of the video. So we're kind of blurring this edge between where the art begins and where it ends, and where the life comes in, um, and that edge of, of sort of what is real and what is not in the piece. So, and the sound is actually part of this work too, you know, the opportunity to do sound because it was indoors. And plant, the plants obviously brought in from the outside and actually out the window, the plants are sort of thrown out into the landscape. So you see out to sort of leads a trail to where the peace fallen sky is. Again, also the idea was that because there was so much uh, natural light in this space, which you know, everyone here from the museum knows is unusual. Um, I wanted to use that so that as the day gets dark or if you go there on a rainy day, the videos are extremely strong, but if there's a lot of light in the space, then the painting is strong. So it has this, it, it, it's a te it has this kind of temporal measurement of the time of day and the weather. Um, and there you can see out the window the, the plants going, going out and sort of breaking the boundary of indoor and outdoor. And, that, and that's the building. Um, and this is, you know, this is a, 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 this, this was the, the second model for Storm King, and that's one of the paintings. And you can see by putting it right in front of it, I did this piece, this is in Switzerland, um, did this in the fall, um, and where I wanted to see it. if you put it right in front of it and you think about it almost like a printmaking idea that they're almost folded together. So that was also in Storm King, but then I was like, let's just make it look almost like it's a stamp into the painting itself. Um, and then to use, so a lot of these are video stills, and right next to the painting, I, I had the opportunity to exhibit a painting, a sculpture, and a video right next to each other. So the same images that are in the painting are actually in the video, and they merge again, so that these mediums kind of generate the next one, one into the next. And this idea that we kind of have of these being separate mediums is a very contrived idea in many ways. So this was a room right next to that painting room, and the videos spilled out, you know, and into the paintings. Um, and this had also had a pendulum in it, um, which, which is, you know, I think the pendulum for me is, it, it leads to this kind of idea in a lot of the video pieces in particular, actually in all of the sculptures, of, of using an artwork as a time, as a, a timekeeper of how we use objects to keep time. So if you go to the Met and you go see an Egyptian sculpture, you have this sense of keeping time over many, many centuries of, of humans and how we use objects to track time. Um, in, this is also in Switzerland. I had this opportunity to actually go out into the space, so it was kind of great. So that's right outside of the gallery space. So the videos were actually projected out into the city and onto the building. Like, so it was a really great opportunity to sort of break, break the, the boundaries of, of, you know, of that space. And it's actually a really wonderful thing about Congress Square as well as it's like this museum spilling out into the space. And I actually, I would love the Robert Indiana too. And I think it's such a great piece. And, but it continues this idea that, you know, the boundaries of the museum and the edges of the museum are sort of spilled into the city itself, which was uh, this, this opportunity in, um, in Basel was really great. That's actually the University of Basel, which happened, which, which was, um, it's the building where Nietzsche taught by chance. Um, so it's this incredible, um, like, sort of building of ideas. And right on, it's right on the Rhine, it's really nice. Um, and so these are, these are um, a series of paintings that I just um, exhibited in London, and the idea was really to emphasize um, this idea of an after image and this idea that one image got, like, sort of leads to the next. So they were all in pairs. So they would have this kind of, you'd be seeing two stages of an image in, in, become, in, in its kind of becoming or in its degradation. Um, I love printmaking and you know, one of the things that you do with printmaking at the end of a press um, printing is often you just let the paper clean the press. So you run 
the press paper through the press, and you basically have this experience of a ghost image. You see the image slowly disappear until the paper is white. So that was one of the ideas for this, to really emphasize that the paintings were about images in degradation or images becoming. Um, and in this, in, in this location, there was this opportunity to play with the indoor and outdoor with a smaller model and like actually just have this piece um, span. And there was a little dandelion, little, a nice little happenstance weed um, that was growing there. So that became part of the piece. Um, and then they actually had a garden in the back. So I put a, a larger piece in the back here. And I think for these sort of public sculptures, it's interesting to me to create something that is very iconic, that is, um, has this kind of, uh, like that sort of statuesque quality that sort of burns into your memory. So the LaGuardia with Portland, something that really marks a space um, that can both be, um, feel monumental in its shape, but also be ephemeral in the fact that it's this, this sort of idea of it breaking down to parts to a hole in front of your eyes. Um, so that is, that is you know, a central theme that, is, that goes through Portland, which is this idea that you are seeing a part to a whole, but our, 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 when we see this, we make the sphere, right? The sphere becomes, we, we build it ourselves, and we're an active engagement with building out the sculpture. And so this is um, a view from inside, and you can see the museum across the street, and the, the sphere kind of mirrors the, the architecture of the building as well, which is also this interesting idea of like architectural, something monumental on this facade, then becoming a see-through to, to the sky. Um, uh, but you can see that the back in here, it's not, it, the rendering doesn't show it, as well because you don't have the foliage, but it's, it will, this entire back here will be, like Storm King, it will be mirrored polished steel. So you'll have the activity of the city mirrored in the back of the piece. Um, and so this was just a conceptual um, sketch for very early thinking about the piece. And I think that there's this idea of gathering was really important, that the place was a spot of gathering and the, the sculpture structurally was actually a kind of metaphor for that, that it was kind of being gathered together as a whole. Um, this idea of reflection, that a sculpture has a potential to be a, 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 actually a moment of deep reflection, um, but that the piece would actually reflect its environment, it would reflect the sky and it would reflect the speed of the city around it. Um, and kind of magnetism, that it would have be a magnet in a um, really important part of the city that kind of is right on, it's almost like a pinwheel where it can be spinning off, but we want to kind of magnetize it and really mark that location um, and so that that location has a kind of signature ownership to it. So this idea of a piece that could hold that and to, to, to decide to sort of put it on that corner um, so that you would, you would uh, see it from a car, you would see it from every direction, it would reveal itself to you, um, whether you were coming out of the museum, whether you were driving through Portland, whether you were in the park, in different ways. And that as you moved around, it's a very old idea, you know, Bernini was the master of it, that as you moved around it, which is one of the pleasures of doing sculpture as opposed to painting, per se, the, the piece actually becomes an entirely different shape. Um, so this kind of making something that is very dynamic in such a dynamic public space. Um, and so this is more specific about some of the works that I showed you before. So similar to LaGuardia, this, this way that we kind of figured out how to have a photograph um, uh, become almost like an enamel onto the metal so that you would have a still photograph on the, so for this piece the idea is that there's a still photograph, you are, it's gonna be a photograph of the main sky is always there no matter what the weather is. And then the back is going to mirror a much faster time. Um, so this is a, a snapshot in time and, and the back just juxtaposed with a kind of time um, that is in constant movement. So this was, the, this was LaGuardia, this is the, the same way that we're gonna use this, um, the, the enameled image, the photograph. 
um, and make it sculptural. And then this is a piece I, I use as an example to talk about the scaffolding behind the piece. So one of the things I'm interested in in sculpture is not having anything hidden, not having like, you know, um, a prop or if there's a plug, the plug is always there. If you saw in the video pieces, the videos are always there. It's, there isn't a, in, a you know, in a, if you choose a theatrical metaphor, there isn't a stage and a backstage and an audience, it's all, you're all merged. So um, for me, the sculptural structure, which is also a basic architectural idea, like the Pompidou is a great example of it, where they put all of, they put all of the mechanicals and the structure on the outside of the building, but the structure is actually really integral to the sculpture, or is even maybe bigger than the sculpture, or who knows what is the structure and what is not. So this piece I did on the High Line, um, it was uh, there for a year, they don't do permanent pieces, and now it lives in a sculpture park in Oslo, which is nice. It's, um, it is, uh, it is um, those are actually birdhouses, but as you can see, the birdhouses, the support for the birdhouses is as, as you know, dramatic part of the language of the sculpture as the birdhouses themselves. But this stainless steel kind of structure is, this, is similar to the structure um, proposed for Portland. Um, and then the back, what I was talking about, so the back of the piece for Congress Square is similar to the kind of stainless steel that we were able to achieve in um, Storm King. So it will have that same kind of quality of reflecting its surroundings, um, whether it's the grass nearby, whether it's a car going by, whether it's a person passing. And here you can see actually the proposal to have it much more you know, grounded in the landscape. So the back of it will have, you know, whatever the season is, will have that reflection into the piece. So the piece will become kind of a weather vane or a timekeeper for what's around it. Um, and there you can see it in relation to um, the museum and uh, that really sort of marking that corner. And you can see a little bit of the dimensions and how it will sit on that corner and the scale of it and the space. That might be the last one, let me see. Nope, I have a few of them. So this is from inside, different seating. That's it from above. And this idea that you can really, coming from any direction in terms of traffic, you're actually, you're, it's catching you at that corner. It's like, a, you know, it's a, it, it hits right at this intersection from, from every entryway. And that's it up close. And I think when, it, when you get up close to it like that, you will have this quality similar to the, the piece that I did in Paris where you really feel surrounded by the work and you have this sky juxtaposed with the sky itself. And you have this scale shift from something very close to you to something quite celestial. Um, so that I think is the last slide. Um, and yeah, so I'm, excited, I said this this morning, but I am excited to bring the sky down into Congress Square. Thank you very much. So I think we're gonna do questions, if anyone has questions about anything. how you build it and what kind of engineering team you have and um, how this all happens, particularly this one. Are you going to build it in a shop and ship it on a truck or will it be assembled here? So, um, so usually what we, we do is we do, we do about this level of rendering and then often build a model to size, a section, and then we have fabricators come and bid the work. And as I mentioned a little bit, we're lucky to work with really creative fabricators. So a fabricator who, uh, you know, many fabricators will only do work they know how to do, and most of these processes are new. Um, so uh, we'll bid, we will bid out the piece, and um, then the work will be made with the idea, of it'll, this will probably come, my, they, they give proposals for how to install it, but my guess would this would probably come in anywhere from, you know, 
six to 20 pieces and we'll probably have screw joints that then put it together in space. I was in Storm King, there was a Calder sculpture that had been there for about 20 years that was being moved to Europe. And they said, we're gonna deinstall it um, tomorrow and while we were installing it. I thought they're gonna deinstall it tomorrow and they came with a flat bug truck and there were about three bolts and it went flat. <laughs> And it was out. So, you know, I, I mean, that is, it's it, and a really, a really good fabricator will make this like an Ikea piece of furniture. So that they, they look, they look like incredible feats and that's part of it, but they're actually, you know, in terms of like building, you know, the bridge to South Portland, like that's, a, that would be, you know, they're more like the kind of way you would build, um, like, you know, an ex, like the piles are the way you would build like a porch. Um, so the, we work with really great fabricators, but for an outdoor piece, that's what we do because it has to be safe. It has to be engineered. We'll have to do a glare study. You know, we'll, there'll be tests um, for you know all of the things that we'll want to keep this permanent and and in good shape um, for many years. Okay, just drilling down slightly on the technical, um, what kind of math creates the joints between the rectilinear parts and then the the surfaces of the sphere, and how do you predetermine that? Or do you have these things adjustable and you do them to eyeball, yeah. which doesn't make sense because they should be fixed attachments? Right. It's a good question. So I think, you know, for me, it's really important when you're working with a fabricator or where you're digitizing things to keep the hand live. You know, and one of the, one of the great examples of doing this is, is Frank Gehry, who basically would take his mask, throw it in the corner, and then he would say, let's render it. So that was, I think, an important thing to show, like the, the sketch, to show the clay, to say to, that it really starts with the hand. I really think you can feel that. It's like when you meet someone on Zoom and then you meet them in person versus like knowing someone um, before and then you spoke with them on Zoom. Like I teach at Columbia and I, I taught my students they, before the pandemic and then they all, we all went on Zoom and I could teach them because I had seen them work and I knew them. But then I had to start with a class that I had never met before and you, and so hard to get that, right? So I think in a similar way, it's really important. This is a circuitous answer to your question, but it's really important to start with the hand. So the structure is totally built by hand. There's one image in here um, that shows it's it's been photoshopped out, but it is actually, um, it's actually the slide. Uh, it's right at the beginning, but um, it's a, it's a slide of a, of a model made by hand so that when the fabricator is doing it, they're actually fabricating something that's been made with my hands. So that's, that's why, I mean, that's why I think that Storm King is successful because it really was a handmade model that really did crack. It's very hard to imitate nature that way to make something look like it eroded. But I, I let it dry. Any of you who've worked with clay, you, know, you have to like let it dry at a certain speed so it doesn't crack. So I let it crack and then worked with those cracks. So it was a constant sort of working with the way something erodes. So the structure in the back is built by hand and then it's t it, the, the fabricator works with those exact joints. And it's supposed to have a kind of idiosyncratic, nest-like quality to it. This, the, the, these sculptures actually began, the first ones from models where I took a, a basketball and I put it and built the structure around it and then removed the basketball. And the basketball was actually an important idea because it was built to the scale of the hand, right? That you can palm a basketball. And those models, um, the model for this is about that scale. Um, and so the scale of this is also, it's, it's, it's very precise. It's like not, it's a little bit more than a Vitruvian man, you know, or woman, but it is the Vitruvian man, so I can say that. So, but it is, you know, that reach, but a little bit more. So it's almost like a personal planetarium. It has this scale that when you get up to it, it's your world is kind of what it's scaled to. Um, so that's how we made the sphere, and that's the decisions about scaling it up. The, uh, the the front of the uh, piece will be colored blue. Yeah. And I was just wondering about more about the back. What yep. would that be colored? So this this work 
unlike um, the other two I showed you, the idea for this work was that the static image is on the inside. So when you're on the outside of the piece, the reflective is reflecting the world around you. But when you go to the center, it's a still, the image is still, but it's shattered. So you're putting it together like a puzzle piece. But as you look up to it, you'll be looking into the sky. So on a, on a very blue day, it may look exactly like the blue sky, but on a, you know, on a rainy day, it'll still be like, so in the winter, it'll still be blue sky. So that the, for this piece, the idea was that the interior is static and the, outs, and the outside is, is a kind of timekeeper for exactly what's going on. I think she's making, I think I'm letting Alice make the decision, sorry. I noticed the street light and I was wondering if there's any, are you depending totally on ambient light around, natural light, or is there any artificial light? So we're gonna work with the, um, we have a lighting designer who's working with the landscapers. So there'll be lights, there are there actually lights from above and from below that will like the piece. Yeah, thank you so much, Sarah, for the, for the talk. It was really fascinating to hear you talk about this piece um, alongside elements like time and entropy and all these things that maybe aren't kind of quite clear at first glance. Um, and my question has to do with materials and, and media, because you've spoken really eloquently about kind of the false borders between painting, sculpture, and, and video. Um, it was great to see uh, the Storm King piece at different scales and also in different environments, some of them really natural and grassy, others more wooded. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about kind of how you imagine this material to fit and work with this kind of really iconic brick architecture that we have all around us uh, mm -hmm. here in Portland. How you think that, um, that, that, will, that will flow and that will work in that space? I mean, I think um, for me, one of the things that's interesting is to, in, with public sculpture is to try and make something that, um, that feels not in, with a permanent piece that feels impermanent. So this idea of something fleeting um, to, and that tension between something fleeting and something um, permanent to always be on the surface. And I think when you're outdoors, like we think of this as, I mean, this is my thoughts on, on that idea of the brick. Um, the sky is the ceiling when you're outdoors. And I think that, that's something, actually my father's an architect and he's, he taught me that at a very young age. He said, when you're outdoors, the ceiling is the sky. And that's why so many people fail at architecture and so many people fail at outdoor sculpture because you can scale yourself in this room, but when you go outside, when you go to nature, it's so easy, you lose really quickly. So I think that actually the sky is much stronger than the brick. Um, and that this is about that in some ways. It's about the ceiling above the brick. Um, and I think this, I mean, this building has this really interesting detail, which is the focus for me, which is the architectural focus of this building is this moment where the brick breaks into a facade. And it says, actually, I'm not a bearing wall structure. I'm a facade, right? Um, and this idea of, 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 you know, that that's a play on the idea of all of these bearing wall structures that now we don't do, we never use brick that way, right? It's always a facade. And that gives you this little, court, you know, this little half moon into the sky. So for me, that was part of the idea, was that we were, it was a way to really talk about the ceiling of, 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 any, of any urban space is still, is still the sky. And I think that the blue it was an important idea. I mean, we've worked, um, there's an incredible group of people I will, were named in the beginning, so I won't name them again in this room. We worked really hard on um, uh, trying to figure out what would be a piece that would stand out um, in a kind of iconic way. And I think the blue, and I think this, this kind of, because we're not used to seeing public sculpture with an image on it, or that with that, that is like that feeling of ephemerality, like when you, you know, LaGuardia is a, the best example that I showed of that. Um, it, it feels like a dandelion that could blow away. That that is, that's, that is actually what can fight the brick, or not fight, but to show itself as being different than the brick itself. Uh, this is such a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Um, I, I just want to know, are you painting while you're thinking about the sculpture too? Is, are, is painting an integral part of your practice while you're designing like this specific sculpture for Congress Square? 
Yeah, I mean, I actually do all, I'm doing all, all I'm doing video, sculpture, public artwork, vid, you, know, it, uh, you know, ephemeral artwork that's indoors all at the same time. For, you know, I was actually trained as a painter. Um, I studied architecture in college, then I gave it up, and then when I went to graduate school as a painter, I became a sculptor. So the, it all sort of merged. When I graduated from graduate school, I was doing sculpture. Actually, I was doing video and sculpture, but at the time, you know, it was, I was using beta tapes this big, and it was so expensive, and um, I went back to video because it was actually really interesting how it became so much, you know, everyday language. Um, but so for me, they're all, they really feel all very fluid. Um, I think that the main difference for me is, um, is the way I work. So the paintings I work com in complete isolation. Um, I have no one around, so they be they're a little bit more interior. And when I'm doing a public piece, I'm really thinking about, you know, how do you, if you're driving by and you see the museum on one side, you know, how do you, I'm thinking much more about how a work is gonna be perceived and, you know, civic space, how something can be communally owned. So I think they have that difference, but I actually think for me, what's interesting is when you can create a sense of intimacy in a public space. So if my public, my, my approach to public art is, this is also to play to your question on the ephemeral and the permanence, but also on the intimate and, you know, and, um, you know, this kind of scale shift from the intimate to the public or the, from the minute to the global and have those shifts happen very suddenly in public space. Thank you so much, Sarah. I really appreciate taking all these questions and just want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. Um, again, I think you're going to mark this night in uh, the history of Portland, having this presentation, having Sarah with us. When we realize this project across the street in Cronkett Square, it's going to really transform this neighborhood and also Portland. And I think you all are very fortunate and lucky to be here tonight. And one of the great things about this project is that it really is a public and private partnership that we're bringing together. And so at some point, we hope you all will support this project. This is really huge for our city, and it's going to send a great message to our neighborhoods, our community, and all of our visitors. Um, so thank you all so much for coming. Have a great night.